My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm giving you a tour of the things we have in our TV set in Moscow. Everything on this set really has meaning to me, including this big bone. You say, what in the world is that bone? Well, I'll tell you what I told my grandkids one day. They came in. They said, Grandpa, what is that big bone? I said, oh, Grandma and I ate a really big chicken, and that's part of the leftovers. Of course, I was teasing. Well, what is this? We know it's not a chicken bone. It's a mammoth bone, and it's part of the leg of a woolly mammoth. Where in the world would I get a woolly mammoth bone this size? Well, it was a gift from a friend, and it's in the studio because it means something to me. Northern Siberia in prehistoric times was covered with herds of woolly mammoths, and today their remains are buried in the permafrost. And when there's a change of weather and the permafrost begins to melt, sometimes the bones and the tusks begin to pop out of the ground and you can just walk through northern Siberia and pick them up. And that's what a friend did. And he gave me this bone. It is the leg bone of a woolly mammoth from northern Siberia. Now, why would I have this bone in my TV studio? What relevance would this have to do with the teaching of the Bible? Well, for me, it speaks a very clear message. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 29, 29, that the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to us. There's a lot of questions about prehistoric times, dinosaurs, where do they fit in biblical history? And we don't have all the answers. That's all right. Some things have not been totally revealed yet. When we see Jesus one day, we're gonna know everything, but for now we know what has been revealed. And if we come to subjects that we don't really know the full answer to, that's all right, because we can stick with what has been revealed. That's what we need in order to build our lives. And when I see this mammoth bone, it reminds me, I don't have to know everything. I just have to know what's been revealed. And that's why this woolly mammoth bone is on my TV set. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust. A message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and this week we're going to have a blast. I'm here today with one of my favorite people. You say, who is that? Joel Renner's here with me. Hey, son, welcome. Hi, Dad. We're going to have a lot of fun today. Joel, what are we going to do today? Today we're going to ask questions and Dad's going to answer them. These are questions that he's collected. Oh, it might have been a couple of years. Yep, yeah, several years people have been sending me questions. And today we're going to answer many of them. And I think this is going to be a very fun program. You know, in the stand-up to today's program, I was standing behind that desk with that big woolly mammoth bone that I told my grandkids was a chicken leg. The grandma and I had a really big piece of chicken that was a leftover, just teasing my grandkids. But people were all the time asking interesting questions. Where do the dinosaurs fit into the Bible? What about the giants in the Old Testament? Where is Noah's Ark? These are all really interesting questions to me. And today we're gonna to dive into some of these questions. But first, if you need prayer, please contact us. Just call us or send us an email. As soon as you reach out to us, we're gonna to begin to really pray for you. It would be a privilege to take your call or to receive your email, please reach out to us right now. We're waiting to hear from you. And when you contact us, remember that we're offering you my brand new series based on these programs called Questions and Answers with Rick Renner. And we have put with it a study guide. The two of these together are just awesome. But guess what else? This week, we're offering everything in our website store for 25% off. That is amazing. It's very special. We only do it a few times a year. And this is the week, one of the weeks we do it. And I think it's special and wonderful. And we wanted to provide everything on our website at a good discount for you. So you can buy more and give it to other people. So that means sparkling gems from the Greek, oh, one, yeah. two, light and darkness, draw room for compromise. Everything. Everything, 25% off. Just go to our website, storerenner.org right now, and you'll see it's all there. Please take advantage of it. What a blessing. But hey, let's jump right into our questions. Are you ready, Joel? I am ready. The first questions, I'm going to combine them. First three questions, and here they are. Ready. 
Who are the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6? Okay. Where did the giants come from? Is ancient mythology true? Well, I would love to answer that question. You know, Joel, I've written a lot of material that no one has ever seen. The Lord told me in 1978, write, 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 and I'll prosper what you write. So I write all the time. In fact, I, is it true, Joel? I write every day. Every day. And to write the kind of material that I write, you have to do some pretty deep study. And so this question about the angels of God in Genesis chapter 6 was an important question for me because of Greek and Egyptian mythology. You know, if you go to the temples, the pagan temples of the ancient Greek world, or the Roman world, or the Egyptian world, you see these monumental temples. It is just amazing. You go all over Turkey today, you see these huge temples, or you go to Greece, or you go to Rome, or if you go to Egypt, and you sail up and down the Nile. As you go up and down the Nile, there are these massive, massive temples. And it is not reasonable that people who are that sophisticated base their religious beliefs just on an overactive imagination. I know we call it mythology, but the ancient pagans did not believe it was mythology. They believed it was based in fact. They really believed all of those things were based in fact. And they believed that there had been an involvement of heavenly creatures with women on the earth. And that this mixture of heavenly creatures and women gave birth to giants and demigods. And guess what? It really has its roots in Genesis chapter 6. I do not believe ancient mythology is just the result of overactive imaginations. Hey friends, remember, the Greeks especially, they gave us poetry, they gave us logic, mathematics, art, architecture. These were brilliant people and they would not have based their beliefs just on an overactive imagination. So, is there a possible historical link between mythology and the Bible? And the answer is yes. And we read about it in Genesis chapter 6. So let's go there. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, verse 2. Now here it is. That the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose. Then the result of this is referred to in verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when these same sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Here is where mythology comes from. It's right in Genesis chapter 6, and this is where the giants came from in the Old Testament. Now, I've written this material called a possible historical source for mythology. And I want to read to you what I have written. Listen to this. A possible theological reason for these giants was referred to by many early church fathers, again, all the way into the 5th century. It was never even questioned until after the 5th century when many things were questioned. But a large number of scholars agreed that the phrase sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 referred to fallen angels, fallen angels, who literally entered the earth's atmosphere with a lustful desire to have sexual relations with women. This is precisely what was written by numerous early church fathers. For example, I'm going to read you a direct quote from St. Clement. He wrote that angels, fallen angels, change themselves into the nature of men. Yet having become in all respects men, they also partook of human lust, and being brought under its subjection, they fell into cohabitation with women. That is exactly what the Bible refers to in Genesis chapter 6. But from their unhallowed intercourse, spurious men sprang forth, much greater in stature than ordinary men, whom they afterward called giants. Is that amazing? Amazing. And Irenaeus wrote, 
unlawful unions came about on earth as angels linked themselves with offspring of the daughters of men who bore to them sons, who on account of their exceeding great size were called giants. Tadian wrote that these fallen angels were captivated by the love of women and beget children who are those who are called demons. And actually, when you read everything that Tadian wrote, you understand it's where all paganism began. It began as a result of this union between fallen angels and women. And Josephus himself wrote these words. For many angels of God accompanied with women and beget sons that proved unjust, that were despisers of all that was good, on account of the confidence that they had in their own strength. For the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians called giants. Now that is the voice of four notable early writers who said that these fallen angels had sexual relations with men and produced giants. And it is also referred to by Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Ambrose, Jerome, Eusebius, Augustine, and many, many others. It is amazing that they all said the same thing. Now, Joel, when you study, especially Greek mythology, you have the story of Zeus and all these other heavenly beings that came to the earth. And if you study Greek mythology, all of those early religions surrounded the worship of these beings. Well, you can imagine if fallen angels came into the earth's atmosphere, that would be quite impressive, even if they were fallen. People would have never forgotten that. They would have been very impressed by these dazzling creatures that showed up. And Greek mythology finds its roots in that. It's in Genesis chapter 6. Wow, that explains a lot. It is a real event that took place, but it was not Zeus. It wasn't his other beings that were with him. It was fallen creatures. And from that event in Genesis chapter 6, many legends came forth, which we now today call mythology. But it had a link to Genesis chapter 6 when a real event took place between fallen angels and women. Well, the Bible is so clear about it. In fact, when you go on and read in Genesis chapter 6, it says that these giants were evil. They were filled with violence. The whole earth became corrupted because of them. It is amazing what took place. And in fact, Genesis chapter 6 says that's why God sent the flood. He sent the flood because the human race was being corrupted by this half-breed of angels and human beings that had been created by the cohabitation of angels with women. But the Bible also refers to this in the New Testament. Both Peter and Jude refer to this event. Is that amazing? Very amazing. For example, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and Jude, verse 6, both of these contain insights to this event where Peter and Jude refer to angels who did something so egregious that God judged them. He punished them. In 1 Peter 2, 4, Peter writes that God placed these sinning angels in chains of darkness. Well, the word chains is the Greek word sira. And guess what? In Greek, it does not refer to a chain. That is a bad translation. It is the Greek word which depicts an underground pit or an underground cavern that was used to contain vicious animals like wolves. Wow. It is the very word used to describe an underground place of retention, containment, or even a prison. But Peter adds that this underground pit, cavern, or prison is completely filled with darkness. The word darkness, the Greek word zophos, which depicts absolute pitch darkness that is void of any hint of light. I would call this darkness that can be felt, darkness that is suffocating. It would be the ultimate punishment for a prison, for an angel which was created to live in glory, to be placed in darkness, so dark that you can feel it, suffocating darkness. And finally, Peter tells us that God put these angels in hell. And guess what the word hell is here? 
the Greek word Tartaros. Well, anybody who knows Greek mythology knows that Tartaros is also referred to in mythology. All these things are connected. Tartaros was the underground cavern pit or dungeon or subterranean chamber where rebellious gods were imprisoned. Even Peter makes a connection between mythology and what occurred in Genesis chapter 6. It is amazing to me, just amazing. Then when you come to Jude, verse 6, of course Jude was the brother of Jesus. He wrote that these angels that sinned had done something so egregious that God bound them in everlasting chains. Everlasting chains depicts God's irrevocable decision, His determination that these particular angels would never escape His judgment and to assure that they would never escape this underground place of containment. God placed these angels in chains. And this word chains depicts the chains or bonds that were reserved for the most dangerous criminals. In God's mind, these were criminal angels. Is that amazing? Amazing. And by using this sequence of words, Jude depicts a moment in history, past history, when God Himself reached out and seized an offending company of criminal angels. That is amazing. And he personally bound them in chains and declared a sentence so final that there would never be negotiation for their release. It refers to these sons of God, fallen angels, that came into the world and cohabitated with women. Now, when you look in the Old Testament, especially at Genesis chapter 6, you find the word Nephilim appears several times. Mm -hmm. The word Nephilim is translated as the word giant. The word giant, the word Nephilim is a word which describes those that were physically enormous, they possessed unnatural strength, and they propagated evil and violence. That Hebrew word Nephilim depicts the immense size of these creatures. They were gigantic, they were monstrous in stature. And Genesis chapter 6, 4 to 5 says there were giants, that's the word Nephilim, there were Nephilim giants, monsters in the earth in those days. So before the flood, this is what we're referring to, the earth's population became so influenced by these creatures that evil and violence filled the earth. And the Bible says they appeared again later. Now, we don't know how they appeared again later. The Bible doesn't tell us, but they did appear again later. And in fact, these giants became so numerous, so populous in the earth, that the Old Testament refers to them over and over and over, where they are called Nephilim, Rephaim, Anakim, over and over and over. And in fact, the children of Israel were to eradicate all of them. But... Here's what I want you to see. Regardless of how exaggerated the fables of mythology had become over thousands of years, it seems unlikely that intelligent Greeks, Romans, and Egyptians would have founded their entire religious beliefs on mere fantasy. Even the early church fathers couldn't buy that. They all said, that mythology had its roots in a real life event which was recorded in Genesis chapter 6. I think that is amazing, Joel. It is amazing. And it is likely that the events in Genesis chapter 6 is the source of all ancient pagan religions. If you look at all ancient pagan religions, they all talk about gods coming to the earth, aliens coming to the earth. You say, how could it be possible that all the ancient religions seem to have the same kinds of ideas because it really occurred in Genesis chapter 6. And Joel, you can imagine, if that occurred, what if you had been there in Genesis chapter 6? You had been part of the earth's population and suddenly these dazzling creatures descended from the heavens and began to cohabitate with women. And the women then begin to give birth to half-breeds, kind of an angelic, human combination, 
creatures that were enormous in size, that had amazing strength, they would become real legends. And that is where ancient mythology comes from. It comes from Genesis chapter 6. I believe this to the core of my being. Now, there are people who try to say that the giants were just strange people that were born of the seed of Seth. That is ridiculous. That's just ridiculous. If you read Genesis chapter 6, it's describing a supernatural event. Now, it happened again later. The Bible doesn't tell us how it happened again later. But Jude and Peter tell us that what these angels did was so egregious in the mind of God that God personally apprehended this category of criminal angels. And God put them in Tartarus. Even that word is in ancient Greek mythology. God put them in Tartarus, underground, subterranean chambers like a prison filled with darkness, suffocating darkness, darkness that can be felt. My friend, that would be the ultimate punishment for an angel that was created to live in the glory of God now to be in suffocating darkness. And they are there to this very moment. It was a prison sentence to never be negotiated. They are there right now. Peter tells us that, and Jude tells us that. So, Joel, I think I've answered your question. I think that's a marvelous answer. And, of course, we don't believe in Greek mythology. We believe no, in the Bible. We believe the Bible. But Greek mythology, the Greeks were not stupid. Their beliefs started somewhere. And it really just affirms that the Bible's true. Yes, that's right. It really does. Genesis chapter 6 really took place. Wow, we have barely got started. We have a lot of questions to answer. And when we come back tomorrow, we're going to dive right into the rest of them. It's going to be a lot of fun. Don't miss tomorrow. It's going to be a great time. But I'll be back in just a moment. And I want to pray for you. We all have questions that we'd like to have answers for, but they often go unanswered. Do you have questions about the Bible that you wish someone would answer for you? In this five-part series, Questions and Answers with Rick Renner, Rick addresses many difficult and challenging questions that have been sent to him over the years. This series doesn't dodge a single issue, but dives headlong into every question asked. Rick says, there are a lot of things I don't know, but to the best of my ability, I have tackled some challenging questions in this series. You'll be amazed at the discoveries you're about to make with Rick in this exciting series. If your heart yearns to find answers to some of your more difficult Bible questions, then this is the series for you. Don't delay ordering your copy today, because you'll discover treasures in this series that you've been seeking for a long time. And this week, take advantage of our two-week cyber sale. We're offering a 25% discount on all our resources. That's right, 25% off everything at our renner.org store. Go to renner.org right now and save on all your favorite teachings by Rick and Denise. Now is the time to order the products you've been waiting for. Go to renner.org today and save big on books, CDs, study guides, and more. Don't miss out on this special offer. And order the teaching series, Questions and Answers, with Rick Renner today. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. My name is Joel Renner, coming to you from Moscow, Russia. And I want to say thank you for watching today and thank you for your support. It's because of ministry partners like you that we're able to distribute quality Bible teaching around the world. And because of your support, we're not only able to air these programs by television, we're also able to translate Christian books into other languages. Because of your financial support, people in areas who have no Christian teaching of any kind, in places where getting a Bible is very difficult, we have been able to distribute millions of these Christian teachings around the world. The Bible says if you know the truth, it will set you free. And we have seen this happen over and over again. We have received thousands of testimonies of how these books we've distributed have dramatically changed people's lives. This is all because of the generous support of our partners, partners like you. Will you consider joining this vision today? Would you consider becoming a partner with us right now? When you do, your help allows us to reach more people, quality Bible teaching from God's Word. With your help together, we can take the gospel of Christ both to the nearby world and to the ends of the earth. That's the vision. Your gift of any size will support these essential and urgent work of getting the Bible and Christian resources into the hands of people who don't have access to it. Please call right now or go online to renner.org. Through your generous support, we can continue to make a huge difference in people's lives.
Wow, I have had such a good time today answering the question about giants, the sons of God, mythology. Joe, have you enjoyed the program? It has been a lot of fun, and I have enjoyed your answer. It was very educational. And Joe, we're just getting started. We're going to come back tomorrow, and we're going to continue. But remember, right now you can order the whole series called Questions and Answers with Rick Renner, and it comes with a study guide. And this week, everything at our website store Joel, 25% off? It is. It is. We made it 25% off. It's special just for you. We only do it a few times a year. And we thought with this series, it would be a wonderful thing to add. You know, people ask me a lot of questions, so we just decided to set aside this week to answer your questions. And tomorrow we're also going to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. There's a lot of really good Old Testament questions. And thank you for sending me your questions. And if you have more, send me your questions. I want to hear from you. In fact, if you need prayer, contact us right now. You can write me right now. As soon as we get your email, we're going to begin to pray for you. Or you can call us. We would love to receive your call. We're waiting to hear from you. We are people of prayer. And when we hear from you, you can be sure we will really pray for you. But I want to pray for you right now. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that the Word of God is so amazing. Lord, every issue is covered in the Bible. Oh, Lord, I ask you to forgive Christians and forgive nations that have forgot the Word of God. Lord, we ask you for a revival of the Bible. Give us a passion for the Word of God that we would dig into it and extract all the treasures that are there waiting for us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So thank you for being with me today. Thank you for inviting me. Let's come back tomorrow and do it again. Friends, we'll see you tomorrow. And please remember one of my favorite verses, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4. It says, where the word of a king is, there is power. The word of God is so loaded with power. So let it work in your life today. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.